fantastic to have you all back for another episode of Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. Now into our 193rd show, it's not that we're running out of topics, it's actually the opposite. But we're increasingly feeling that uh, an increasing number of viewers slash audience slash population are kind of losing touch with architecture for reasons that we will talk about. And so we will use something that we've been using for a while in the shows as vehicles for thought. And that starts with A, just as architecture is called automobiles. <laughs> and for that, we're having a panel together on, in three different climate zones and three different cultures on three different continents, although that's not entirely correct if we would subsumize the Y into Oceania, you know, then that would maybe work, but never mind. Let's not get into that one. <laughs> And so uh, it's me, your host, uh, Martin Despang, near Munich, Germany. And it's you, DeSoto, uh, back in Honolulu, Hawaii, right? And Hello, everyone. It's, and it's you, Ron, back in, Long Be in your Long Beach, California. Yeah, I'm so pleased to be back with you two after watching about two months of these wonderful programs about Finsegrity with uh, you and Larry Medlin. Thanks for having me back. Thank you for being our most loyal viewer and, and fan and uh, collaborator, because it's actually three hosts or three panelists this time for probably as many volumes as we did with Larry. And yep. so um, how do we wrap our arms around this one here? With the first slide being up, you know, uh, we probably shouldn't even talk about what we will talk about, because uh, while 60% of the world climate uh, energy consumption is consumed by architecture, the other biggest chunk is actually by transportation. And obviously, we should move people with mass transportation and public transportation. And that's where, you know, what she slides show, you know, I'm coming from professionally. Uh, the island is going there with a with a, with a rail, with a heavy rail. We're, we're recommending to also introduce light rail back. And then, but then for the last year, we had the pandemic, right? And, and so uh, while on the top right on, on slide two, uh, Jay, uh, about a year ago with a scholar from the uh, East West Center, she did the very best to still rally for public transportation and tell people, you know, it's safer than you might think. But regardless, uh, I guess, of this great, you know, you know female effort, and talking female, by the way, I want to dedicate this show to my dear mother, whose birthday it is today. So, dear mom, happy birthday. And um, so, um, you know, we, we're going to have, regardless of all this public transportation, people have been gravitating back to their personal bubble, right? To their cocoon of a, a tin can moving around. And, and in fact, here in Munich, as you see up there, we're going to host the biggest automotive show in the world. It used to be in Frankfurt, well, Detroit, you might think, but that has changed. But now it's coming to Munich. The city of Munich is actually launching a, a counter uh, act um, um, event, uh, which is, will focus more on the non-automotive uh, transportation system. So um, that all being said, um, let's, go to the, let's go to the second slide and be a little bit, you know, confess that... Uh, you know, this, um, we don't want to be misunderstood as chauvinist, right? But I'm, I'm quoting my dear, a sweetheart, Suzanne, who basically, in preparation of the show that we've been for months now, her most uh, comment is, oh, you guys and your cars, right? And, and we will point out, you know, it's inclusive and, and women are involved. But in, in all honesty, probably statistically, it's fair to say, it's it's a guy's thing. It's it's guys dominated, and the the kind of the working title of the show I I called it after a German movie from the past that you're a fan of, Desoto, and that's called Die Drei von der Tankstelle, which is the three from the filling station, right? And that's pretty much what we're about. And let's talk a little bit about the images we throw in there. What are your thoughts about these? How did this even yep. come into the show? Yep. Yeah, I should jump in and just to say that uh, really for the next few weeks, this topic of automobiles and what it means to be living in an auto-centric culture, which is both positive and neg negative, is obviously a really broad uh, subject. 
But before we begin to, to discuss that subject, I think there's one aspect of automobiles that we three can sort of agree upon. And that's what you were just saying, Martin, that cars are a sort of a guy thing because they are so sexy. We love them. Uh, even automobile uh, parts can be sexy. And hopefully I'm not offending uh, any of our women viewers if we consider a whole new art form that grew up around the automobile. And that is the girly pinup art that was likely to be displayed on the walls of auto repair shops. And we're going to be looking at we're going to be looking at uh, two examples of 40 years and an ocean apart. At the bottom center of the slide is a 1924 advertisement for Michelin tires. And you can see, obviously, that there's a beautifully nude young French woman balanced upon a very spindly car tire, typical of 1924. To the right, top and bottom of the slide are two 1964 depictions of naked young American women hugging giant AC spark plugs in 1964. DeSoto corrected my notion that this was advertising material because instead it turns out they were part of a series of paintings by a very famous pop artist in Los Angeles named Mel Ramos, and he called the series the California Car Queens. And that's enough said. <laughs> and I think the other thing we can add, too, is that the Michelin man, whose name is Bibendum, is also visible on this slide. And he is a happy guy whose body is composed of a stack of tires. So he's a, the opposite of, of sexy. He's cute and he looks like a cartoon figure. And he also is, is there to um, sell things that are related to cars. So there are different ways to appeal to people when you're trying to sell them cars or car accessories. You can go the sexy route or you can go the cute route. Yeah. And you're and showing next to Bibendum the fact that uh, in the 60s, especially, uh, uh, girls in, in uh, miniskirts were always used to present new cars at auto shows. That's, that's exactly right. That's one of your favorite clips. The Soto you yes, it is. That's that's a that's a gas station. It, that's from a Spanish movie, and it's a gas station uh, that's staged as though it was a little discotheque with go-go dancers all around this <laughs> Rolls Royce. Um, and yeah, Ron, you are absolutely right. I mean, that was a staple of car shows for many years. The new car on a rotating platform with one or two beautiful young women posed with it or sitting in it. Um, again, that goes back to this whole appeal to the masculine people who are the ones who primarily like cars. It's a and guy one, thing. And one thing we want you audience to do is like, we, we're going to throw in some personal sort of connections, some personal angles, and why would you have to care for our crazy stories? Because we want you guys to think about your experiences, your dreams, your aspirations, your obsessions around the automobile and then think, do you have similar ones about architecture? And to the very left, this is my first angle here, a funny one. When I first came to the US, the holy land I always wanted to get to, and it took me until college, there was this Bose Arts Ball. And there was this German guy who was on a scholarship, so I didn't make much money. So I couldn't like rent, afford to rent costume. And so I basically, in the Midwest, in the prairie, which is car centric because that's where you grew up, Ron, too. So you can confirm that. There, these were the days when, when, when wheels, rubber tires still had inner tubes. And I was shopping around and got you know, a diversity of them from the largest ones, went from a tractor down to a, a golf cart. And basically, had the shop guy basically helped me assemble the uh, Bibendum, the Michelin Man. So I went as the Michelin Man and, and I won the award of the, the best <laughs> costume. It was basically based on automobiles. When I came back, I think I only got hired back in Lincoln, Nebraska for my teaching career some one and a half decades later, because in my interview lecture, they basically said, oh, here's the Michelin Man, right? So I had, you know, I had to do the Michelin Man again and, and 15 years had passed, so what I was able to do very easily to have them bounce me around uh, wasn't that easy anymore, but I still, I still tried. So, uh, you know, you guys think about your similar kind of crazy memories about, about the mobile, which gets us to the next slide. 
And now yeah, we want to... That... Ron? Yes, go ahead. No, this is basically in the next slide is you in front. Now we want to talk about okay. the cars. Share with the audience. We want you, the audience, to think about what car are you currently driving and why are you driving that and how are you putting this into the context of the architecture around you. So this is your turn now. This is your Audi yeah, yeah, A4 cool. that is about 15 yeah. years young, right? That's correct. Yeah, and it's certainly uh, not true that cars are just guy things. The, the, what the automobile provided uh, everyone is major. In fact, the mobility and speed it provided were absolutely necessary for the modern age. But here I am posted uh, near my 80th birthday in front of my trusty 2006 Audi A4 sedan. It looks, uh, it looks rather ordinary, but with that Audi uh, engine under the hood, when I do drive overnight from uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, to visit some friends, I'll get on that flat, straight road in the Central Valley, Agricultural Valley of California, and this rather ordinary-looking car gets up to 120 to 130 miles per hour, which I can hold it at that speed for at least an hour before I'm leaving the valley. And while doing that, it's pretty energy efficiency. It's pretty good on gas mileage, right? Yes, it is. It's been a, a terrific car. I've never had one for 16 years. I don't consider it old or used. It's just uh, a device that has made uh, the last 16 years uh, an adventure. Yeah, and if we look at the top pictures on that page, uh, we, we can see an affinity to uh, your, your house that we did a show about, uh, which has similar properties, right? It's, it's a simple house, but efficient and effective. It's pretty good on gas mileage, meaning it doesn't need a lot of air conditioning. And it's a house for the people, right? Because by the way, the Audi company belongs to Volkswagen, which means the people's car company. And your house is a people's house, right? Very much so. Thank you. Okay. Now we also want you, the audience, to go back in time and think about your first encounterment with automobiles. And this is your turn again. Next slide. Yes. Here I'm posing 77 years earlier. Here's my three-year-old self posing in front of my first experience of a car. It was my dad's 1937 Chevy coupe. Uh, this would have been new about the time that the Lures house was being built. The Lures house is up in the upper left-hand corner of the slide. Uh, and DeSoto, you reminded me that this particular car was very much a favorite of salesmen because it had such a huge, capacious uh, trunk in the back. Right. And it, was, it didn't have to carry a lot of people. So if you were a salesman driving around trying to sell products to people, you needed space to carry all your products, but you didn't need a lot of space for people. So this was, uh, in many cases, these were called salesmen's cars. They were marketed to salesmen. And they were also inexpensive. They were the cheapest type of passenger car you could get, too. And I must say that uh, uh, there's only a single seat in this car. That's one reason the trunk is so large. So there's a driver and a passenger. And then there's three three year old self, my, myself, who's so short that they could stuff me into a kind of a shelf above uh, and behind the seats where I'd lay out flat and look through the rear uh, window of the car. All right. No such thing as a car seat for a child in those days. Yeah, and there's, nope. I mean, maybe we're looking at this nostalgically, but the, the Lures house is what you very carefully and, and masterfully remodeled into the Halekolani. And I mean, from my point of view, who has only heard about these days and now sees the artifact, there's some real elegance to that, both in the, in the mobile and the immobilia of, of both cases. So with that, that gets us to you, DeSoto. What are you driving these days? Next slide. Well, this is my current car. And just like Ron, it's, it's got a few years on it. It's coming up on uh, seven or eight years now. It's 2013 Honda Fit. And I am a big, big believer in cars, not necessarily being extremely fast, but being utilitarian. I want a car that can carry people. It can carry things. I insist on a hatchback that means it's easier to load things and unload things 
and I want a car that's small and easy to drive. I don't need to drive long distances at high speed. I live on the island of Oahu. I don't. I can't drive for overnight to get to some other place. So this is my car, and I happen to photograph it in front of the uh, Kauaihau Plaza building on King Street in downtown Honolulu. And this is a building that's occupied in large part by Kamehameha schools. And you like to say that that's uh, dedicated to people. And this car, I believe, is dedicated to people as well. Um, something that is very interesting to me is growing up in the United States versus you growing up in Europe, how we viewed the cars of the respective other countries. And that I was a big believer and still am in foreign cars as opposed to American cars. And we'll talk more about that as we go along. The metal is always more silver on the other side. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, but how did this all start out, your connections to the automotive? Next slide. Well, here is little youngster um, with, in the, in the little picture, you see, you see me standing, not the little picture, but the picture on the lower left. You see me standing in the snow. Well, that was unusual because I didn't live in a snowy area, but I did spend one year living in Boston, Massachusetts when I was in first grade, 1960-61. And behind us, behind me, is the car that my family had that year, and it's a 1960 Plymouth. And then amazingly enough, the exact same car showed up years later uh, when your son, uh, Martin, was shipping his shave ice truck from Germany to Malta, and there is the same 1960 Plymouth, the same color even. Um, when I was a little kid, starting in the late 1950s, when I started to notice cars, the cars that I really liked were the Chrysler Corporation, what were called the new look cars. They had big fins, and that's what you see, that delightful, the lovely DeSoto, that's a 1957 DeSoto. <laughs> That was, that was my dream car as a very little kid. It looked space age. It looked like something out of the future. Um, I thought the styling of these cars was amazing. And I wished that we had a car like that. And that's something that I still retain to this day. I have a fondness for 1950s cars, even though at the time I was still pretty clueless about what cars were, et cetera. I just thought these looked pretty wonderful. They looked the lovely dynamic and dynamic, I might say. Yeah, so that much about DeSoto's DeSoto's, <laughs> which leaves me get to the next slide. And this is uh, the car I'm currently driving. We introduced it as our PI mobile when I'm back on the island that you're graciously hosting now, uh, DeSoto, and your, um, the house you grew up in. And this is a car that's also familiar to you, Ron, because we've been using it when we were touring lots of the projects that your friend and partner, business partner, and, 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 and boss um, Edward Killingsworth was building. Um, and your projects, the Hollet Puna, which is now the, you know, the Waikiki Park Hotel formerly. And uh, so this is one of the longest made car models in, in, in modern car history. They made it for almost two decades, unchanged. And we see the similarity to, the, to this vintage architecture that you've done, been producing that luckily. And we're, you know, telling, talking Kamehameha School to Soto, who owned the varsity building by, by Pete Wimberly, uh, the great colleague. And we said, this is a keeper. Don't tear it down. Just like you wouldn't wreck one of these SLs because they're collectibles, they're vintage, right? And so there is a similarity between the two. And so just like Mercedes was pretty sure they're gonna, they're gonna design a classic and it has been holding true. And so I think uh, Ron, you elaborate a little bit more when you were designing your buildings, you were always staying true through a half a century to your, to your modern goals, right? And weren't going jumping yep. on some kind of flashy trips that then we're getting out of fashion soon. You were just staying true and, and time has proven you right. Is that correct to say? Yeah, we, we uh, the killings of the firm especially was looking for designing something that had real staying power over the years. 
You, know, you wouldn't be, you, you couldn't look at it and say, oh, yeah, 1954 or whatever. But then it was kind of a, a timeless architecture with timeless values to it that made it uh, successful as uh, as resorts and hotels. And I must say that uh, in the lower right corner, that's me. Uh, and I've never felt more cool than when I was being driven around by you, Martin, in that gorgeous blue uh, Mercedes convertible. Thanks again for getting me around everywhere uh, for the Docomomo National Symposium. Well, and, and needless to say, it's a convertible. We like to call things like that easy breezy, right? And that is also true for the architecture. They're all basic thought staying away from air conditioning in most parts, trying to be naturally ventilated. And so once again, these are you know, exotic. You guys are not from Hawaii. You guys are from California or originally even, you know, both Ed and you are, you know, from the, the heartland. And, and so, um, you know, you came to Hawaii with this very tropical exotic attitude, right? And, and, and we're contributing architecture that is very appropriate to Hawaii. And so is obviously a convertible, right? Because it's just taking advantage of the breeze and, and enjoying it. So there's enough similarities between two. So uh, last but least, um, I we're going to wrap up the show with the next slide, which is how my access to that. And as you just sort of already said, you know, you were basically into these uh, European cars, and I was into these American cars. So, um, you know, in the sandbox, I was playing with these Straßenkreuzer, with these big boats. You see one of these in the middle there, the, the, the box has Kojax Buick in there. And so the, the other asteroids around were like, this was like 70s Star Wars. Basically, then my uh, banana seat bicycle that you can see there. And then music big times as Earth, Wind and Fire and George Benson that at the very bottom right, I had the chance to uh, attend uh, his two of his concerts, and then it was his book signing at Barnes and Noble. So there is George and I, and I basically introduced myself to him. I gave him my business card, which is moment shows, and he said, "Oh, this is interesting. I I think architecture is kind of cool." And I said, "Yeah, and you're the reason talking cool why I'm here in America because you embody." You know, that's what which was, you know, impossible in Germany, all these things, you know, only in America. So basically, this is sort of my angle where basically I, I come from. So we all come from different angles, but we all end up, you know, around automobiles. And so let's go to the next slide. I think we have time for for some more. And let's talk about the very early beginnings of that. And I let you guys because you contributed these crazy machines from the heydays of automotive, right? Well, the, the beginning yeah. of the automobile, if I can just start quickly, is the steam power. And steam power got started in the 19th century, first to uh, power things like steam locomotives to pull trains, made a huge revolution in how people could travel over land. And initially, that's what people tried as the way to power automobiles. And the automobile as we know it today, a lot of people assume that it was an invention of the United States, and it was not. It's actually something that came from Europe primarily in the form that we know it, although steam power did not last for a very long time. What we now know as automobiles pretty much got invented and used for the first time in Europe. Yeah, and if this is the slide with all of the black and white uh photos on it, and I believe it is, uh, I can run through probably the, the quickest and the, the most abbreviated history of land vehicles you can imagine. Uh, the, the, uh, the fact is that the, the very first uh, people to sort of consider what a self-propelled land vehicle were, were artists. And you're seeing a drawing there in the upper center by Leonardo da Vinci from as far back as 1478. This is a, a strange idea, a wonderful idea of his, to have a spring-driven car. And it sort of operated just pretty much the same way that a large wind-up toy does. But the importance of this is that the practice of art was joined to the practice of invention and design. And as uh, uh, DeSoto was saying, 
before we could talk about internal combustion, gas-powered, self-propelled land vehicles, there were designs created for these really bulky and unwieldy steam-driven contraptions, uh, as shown in this sort of English patent application from uh, from 1832 at the lower right. And as, uh, again, DeSoto was saying, uh, steam-driven vehicles with huge boilers were in use even earlier than that in the late 18th century, such as the example at the upper right of uh, a French uh, car of sorts. It consisted of a huge boiler on a wooden frame and a single seat and no steering wheel but a steering level. And then at the upper right, uh, we sometimes ask ourselves, and it's not really decided yet, but who might have been truly the, the, the inventor of the automobile as we know it now? And many of the historians divide that honor, and Mart, uh, Martin should be proud of this, of course, between Carl Benz and Gottlieb Daimler. And these inventors, which are not in the picture <laughs> that I've shown there, uh, at the end of the 19th century, the very end of the 19th century, pioneered this area of modern automobiles, not as artists, but as engineers and machinists. And what we're looking at is a Benz 1886 four-stroke single-cylinder gasoline-powered motor installed on what looks like a pretty unstable three-wheeled vehicle that owed much to bicycle design. And the two uh, stately gentlemen are cruising along at a uh, top speed of 11 miles per hour and on only nine-tenths of one horsepower. Absolutely. And if we go back... Um... Before we have to wrap up here to the very, uh, you know, top left picture, the, the first picture, number one. Yeah. Uh, this is, as you'd said, Ron, you know, early in the days, this is talking about this sort of, you know, uh, you, you see these sort of scandalous people there, you know, um, uh, associated with sin. And so the automobile was considered to be something sort of devilish, right? There were these kind of roaring you know, machines that were loud and, and, and polluting and rowdy, right? So once again, you got this sort of masculine in there that, that people were just not used to, right? Yeah, the, the, in fact, the, 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 the shock of the new in terms of what seemed to be a sudden appearance of automobiles around the world everywhere was really a constant theme of a lot of early 20th century art. What we're looking at at the upper left, which again, I hope is not offensive to our female viewers, is a kind of very whimsical example of a painting by a French artist named Paul Zouvet in 1904. It was called Fright. And what it's depicting is a very classical orgy of naked nymphs and satyrs. And of course, satyrs were half man, half horse. But their party is being very rudely interrupted by the sudden appearance of a menacing automobile in a road. All right, and with that, that's the closing note for today. We just got started, so we're looking forward to much more uh, next week in our volume two. And until then, uh, thank you both for this exciting panel that we just started. And until then, please uh, all stay equally uh, mentally mobile. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.